Hi, welcome to the second video in my science series. In this video, I want to talk about Starmaya coffee, which is an F1 hybrid developed in Nicaragua. But first, what I wanted to talk about is some new images and um, logo and artwork that I had done by a gentleman here in Bali. Um, this is the new logo you can see, and he did a great job. I'm very happy with what he did. He and I had uh, about a 30-minute call, and I had collected images and ideas that I already had in mind, but basically I gave him creative freedom to do whatever he wanted to do with this artwork. I basically told him um, my core idea was the traditional skull with a, a rose in the teeth, but I wanted to replace the rose with a coffee branch and then include some coffee paraphernalia. And so this is what he produced, and uh, I'm pretty impressed with it. You can see in the background, it's difficult to see in this video, but he has, um, the background is, is repetitive coffee paraphernalia, so you can see a Hario pot there in the background. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, I doubt it. Um, but it's pretty cool. I'm pretty happy with it. You can find him on... Uh, Instagram, and from Instagram, you can also find him, find his homepage. So I'll show you, here's what his Instagram looks like. Um, you can see, you know, I really liked his style of art. Uh, he's also quite politically active. And, and from his Instagram site, you can get a link to his broader portfolio here and see a larger representation of his work that includes not only drawings or illustrations, but photography. And he does web design as well. So really cool. Check him out. And now let's get into this paper. This is the main paper we're going to talk about. And um, this is open source. So anybody with the link has access to it. You can do a search or I provide the link down in the description. Uh, it's not gated. You don't have to purchase it, which is great given its content. Like we did on the first video, let's go through the paper, the research paper, and talk about some of the components of the paper itself so that we get a better understanding of how to navigate papers like this. Um, this would be the document identifier, and most researcher, research papers have a document identifier such as this. Um, this link shouldn't change, whereas um, the link up here for the journal may change. Uh, you can see the list of researchers, and they're always listed in order of their, rel their contribu contribution. So the lead investigator or the uh, principal investigator, the PI, will be listed first. And um, because this is not only an, uh, an open journal, they also utilize the open review system, which means that uh, the authors know who the reviewers are and the reviewers know who the authors are. Remember in the first video I showed, it was a single blind reviewing system where the authors didn't know who the reviewers were, but the reviewers knew who the authors were. So here on the left-hand side, we can see reviewed by, and you can see the two reviewers of this paper. And you might recognize Aaron P. Davis. He was interviewed by James Hoffman on James' YouTube channel. Um, it's a pretty good interview. Um, Aaron Davis works at the Botan Royal Botanic Gardens in uh, the UK. The video is pretty interesting with James Hoffman, and Aaron Davis has a pretty interesting history within the coffee industry. And remember that reviewers of research papers have to be in a given industry because they have to have knowledge of what's being researched. So look up Aaron, Aaron Davis, check some of his work out. Uh, it's pretty interesting. He does a lot of work with genetics, um, hidden varieties or lost varieties, found varieties. 
so on and so forth. So looking at this paper, we see um, the introduction. And again, um, the introduction could also be called the abstract, or sometimes you'll see summary here. This gives you a broad overview of what the paper is about. You're going to get to see the conclusion here. You're going to get to see the authors will define exactly the question they seek to answer. Uh, they might give you some of the background research, some of other research that's already been done. And all of this allows you to quickly ascertain whether this specific piece of research is going to be useful for your given topic. So part of reading research is to start with the introduction or the abstract or the summary, whatever the, the researchers call it, and get a good understanding of what the paper's about. So we can see here, they say right up front what they're, they're investigating, which is the implementation of a seed production system using sterile male plants and evaluating the performance of an F1 hybrid. Much like the last paper, there's a lot going on in this one, even more so with this one. This is a massive paper, multiple studies, multiple years uh, that this study spans. Um, so what I'm going to go over here in this video is just scratching the surface of what is available in this research paper. So I highly recommend you come back after you watch the video and go through the paper yourself. Um, and digest it. The full paper is available at this link. You can see the entire paper right here. You don't have to download the PDF. And I find sometimes that it's easier to navigate in the browser than it is to actually read the PDF. And one of the main reasons for that is I can do a word search in here and find words, whereas oftentimes in um, Max um, preview app, I can't search a lot of PDFs for individual words. It gets frustrating. Um, and maybe there's a workaround for that, and I just don't know it. So you can see that um, just from the, the scroll bar over here, how long this paper is. Very involved. It's a multi-study paper. They did multiple different experiments within this, this paper. They, they detail how they established star Maya as a breed. They detail how they tested the development of a seed garden. They also detailed how they tested star Maya commercially on its own as a, as a, a coffee tree in and of itself. Uh, they also talked about, um, this is some SSR testing that they did uh, to validate or DNA fingerprint validate the, the genetics of the underlying plants the underlying genetics of the plants. So it's it's quite an in-depth paper. And again, we're just going to scratch the surface here. So I put together a presentation to kind of keep me on track and organize the information and to also provide some visuals for you to make the experience a little bit more rich. So I pulled together information from multiple papers for this presentation. And in this list of papers that I've included here, these are the titles of the papers. And you can see at the end of some of the, the titles an open lock icon. And that is going to indicate that it's open access or available to everybody regardless. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to have um, any kind of a, a login for it. I get access to a lot of papers through the research library of the university I'm attending. And... Uh, the open access papers, you don't have to have any of that for. The first paper, uh, G&E Interactions on Yield and Quality. G&E stands for Genetics and Environment. And anytime you have gene expression, there are going to be two factors that in influence um, what that trait is. And those two factors are genes and the environment. The genes are upstream from the environment, obviously. So you have to have the genes available for most traits in order for them to be expressed. And then the environment can influence those traits on top of uh, the genetic or epigenetically influence those traits. And this paper 
They did some experiments where they compared F1 hybrids to traditional uh, cultivars, American Elite cultivars. And what they found was that the F1 hybrids outperform the cultivars in yield, in pest and disease resistance, in climate change adaptability, in quality, in a number of, of metrics, the F1 hybrids outperformed the cultivars. So that's an interesting paper to check out specifically about F1 hybrids and their performance when compared to traditional cultivars. The second paper is one that I purchased. And that came from the uh, 25th International Conference on Coffee Science in 2014. I paid, I think, 10 euros or $10. I don't remember what, what the currency was, um, but it wasn't tremendously expensive. And I will also say that there is no information in that study necessarily that you won't get from the third. The third research paper is what I just showed you, the metadata that I just showed you. Um, it has a majority of the information that I discuss in this paper. Now, to get a fuller picture, to get more details, you can go through the other papers as well. And then lastly, here I list this World Technology Frontier. This is an economics paper, and I think it's important to pull in some of the economics behind these things because um, that is the the critical motive behind Star Maya, in my opinion, um, that's going to make it an impactful hybrid if it's executed properly. And we'll get into that in a, in a little bit. So I'm going to break this presentation down into three key concepts. And I'm going to spend the most time on it discussing F1 hybrids, what they are, how we get them, because it's... Uh, First and foremost, it's fascinating to me, but also because it's good to understand what they are and understand the way we understand how the magic of the F1 hybrids comes about. And then I'm going to talk about male sterility with plants and a, the seed garden concept. All three of these tie in together to uh, form what is important about Star Maya. And I think that these three key concepts are worth our understanding. The F1 in F1 hybrid, it stands for filial, the first filial generation. And filial is from Latin, filius for son, or filia for daughter, and filialis for neuter. And that gives us the filial generation. We just talk about F1s or hybrids. F1 hybrids are typically used in seed production. Um, you start with inbred lines as the parents, and I'm going to explain here in the next couple of slides what is an inbred line, how do we get to an inbred line, and why are they useful in F1 hybrid production. And one of the things to remember when we talk about F1 hybrids is that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So there's a key advantage with F1 hybrids called hybrid vigor or heterosis that gives F1 hybrids their advantage over traditional cultivars. Now, what causes hybrid vigor or heterosis? We don't have a complete understanding of, but what we do know is it's, um, it tends to be genetic diversity, and we're going to look into that now. So I have a lot going on in this image, um, and it's a simplified overview. So what we're looking at is um, a representation of one locus or one genetic trait that is formed in a diploid plant by two genes. So diploid means that you take two alleles, they combine to express a given characteristic. Robusta is diploid. Interestingly, this is also why Robusta's genome map was studied first before Arabica, because Arabica is tetraploid, which means it takes four alleles in Arabica to express a gene. So your uh, Punnett map or your 
understanding of, of how genes are expressed in Arabica is a little bit more complicated. So for simplicity's sake, we're going to work, we're going to consider diploid organisms and we're only going to consider one trait. So in this image, I've used colored triangles to represent the phenotype or the physical appearance of our given trait. And in this, in this example, the trait is just the color of the triangle. But the phenotype could, could be represented by the color of the cherry when it's ripe. So the color of the cherry could be orange, it could be red, it could be yellow when it's ripe. Uh, that's determined by genes. The, the shape of the leaf could be the phenotype, so you could have long and skinny leaves, you could have short and round leaves, so on and so forth. Dwarf plants versus tall plants, all of that is included in phenotype. And then genotype is the underlying genetic makeup of the plant, and the genetic, the genotype de determines largely the phenotype. The environment, remember, has some play in there. Um, but for this for this discussion, we're going to focus on genetic uh, genotype and phenotype. Now, with genes, we have a dominant or a recessive allele. Dominant is what gets mostly expressed, and then the recessive doesn't. So, if you think about eye color in humans, brown would be a dominant allele, and blue would be a recessive. So, if the individual has a G, an, an allele for brown eye and blue eye. Because the brown eye is dominant, that individual will have brown eyes. But if the individual has a recess, two recessive genes for blue eyes, then they're going to express blue eyes. So it's the same in this um, illustration where we see that here, this individual, uh, B1, is homozygous dominant for red. And this individual here on the right is homozygous recessive for green. So when you're homozygous recessive, you express that trait. When you're uh, homozygous dominant, you express that trait. But when you're heterozygous, you express the dominant trait. So here we see um, these. this represents, this top line represents the parent generation. The X is universal to indicate a cross. So we cross these two heterozygous plants, and then our first gen our generation is a game of probability. And breeders know the various probabilities. We've we've done enough experiments where we've where we've a we are able to predict the probabilities of different um, generations given the parents' genotype. So when you mix two heterozygous parents, you're going to get a 25-50-25 probability of outcome. So you'll get 25% homozygous dominant, 50% heterozygous, and then 25% homozygous recessive. And then in inbreeding, what we're trying to do is produce a true breed or a fixed type where the traits are consistently expressed as homozygous. So here we see we take two parents, A1 and A2, and cross them to create the generation, the B generation. And then we can explore the genotype a little bit more by crossing A1 with one of its progeny. We inbreed it. And when we inbreed it, depending on the outcome of the next generation, in this, in this slide it would be generation C, we can see that we've we've got 100% homogeneous phenotype. And that tells us that one of our parents is homozygous. And because in this generation B1, we have a recessive phenotype displayed, a rogue, we know that A1 is the heterozygous parent. So this is how, and this takes generations, this doesn't happen necessarily in the in you know the second or the third generation it can um, and also remember that it's um, a1 is crossed with b1 it's crossed with b2 b3 b4 and then you have to observe those progeny to see what phenotypes they're displaying in order to infer the genotype so it gets very complicated and it's a lengthy process because 
coffee trees take two years before they uh, become reproductively mature, sometimes three to five years. They certainly take three to five years to become economically mature. So once we have fixed or true breed parents for the given trait, we can then cross them and produce a, uh, an F1 generation. Now, one of the things that's interesting about an F1 generation is you can produce an F1 generation repeatedly. Every time you cross the same parents, the same true breed parents, you create the F1 generation. The F2 generation doesn't happen until you cross the two F1 progeny. And this is important for breeding because, um, because of the way recombination works. When you cross these two F1 hybrids, we're back to the first slide where the probability of outcome is 25, 50, 25. With true breed parents, you're going to get close to 100% homogenous offspring. And that's the, some of the magic of F1 hybrids is you can see that each individual progeny of a true breed cross displays the same genotype and the same phenotype. They will also um, grow to the same height. They will also fruit at the same time, which is very useful if you think about coffee production in industrial countries such as um, Brazil, where they have giant mechanical harvesters that they drive over top of rows of coffee, the tornado harvesters that strip pick all of the coffee. That is enabled because of F1 hybrids and their homogenous stature, their homogenous uh, fruit setting, so on and so forth. So F1s have a lot of advantage over traditional cultivars. So remember when I said that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts when it comes to F1 hybrids. Another way we can put that is Paul McCartney's great, but the Beatles were better. And why are the Beatles better? Because of harmony. So we can think of hybrid vigor as harmony between the, the genetics of the parents. Now, heterotic characteristics are quantitative, which means we get a spectrum of display of, of trait uh, characteristics. And when this comes in into play is when we start to look at, well, what characteristics are heterotic? Not all characteristics are. Some are largely binary. Um, others are heterotic, which is a range. And those are um, things such as seed or biomass production, which is another way of saying yield. Seed composition. Um, so think about the, the fats and the acids and the sugars that are in the individual seeds. These are all important to coffee roasters. Um, plant growth, plant um, growth rate and stature are also heterotic. So that means that all of these traits get um, enhanced when we create an F1 generation. And one of the critical heterotic traits is stress tolerance. And uh, stress tolerance can be inferred to climate change. So if you have a plant that is tolerant of drought, then you have a plant that's better adapted to a multitude of climates and also to climate change. Same with heat stress. Um, so this is where F1 hybrids come in very useful, is um, when we're renewing or regenerating, rejuvenating a coffee farm, if we're using F1 hybrids that we know to be adaptable to multiple different climates, they're likely going to be adaptable to climate change as well. So Coffea arabica is autogamous and it is hermaphroditic. That means that the plant, the, the flowers have male and female parts. That's the hermaphroditic part. And then autogamous means it's self-compatible. It can breed with itself. And interestingly, Coffea arabica is about 60% um, self-compatible, whereas Robusta, it's also self-compatible, but at a much lower rate, 12 to 20 percent, I think. So a majority of the time with Arabica crosses, you're going to get it crossing with itself. And that becomes important when we talk about genetic drift, 
because as a as a an organism selfs replicates with itself, it drifts towards the homozygous trait. So remember when I talked about homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive, and the only time you get a recessive trait expressed is when it's uh, homozygous, when you have both traits. That is important with selfing because we drift towards that. So you can see what this image is showing. What this image is showing is, is successive generations of selfing. So generation zero is your first plant. It produces offspring from itself. That offspring will have it, the normal 25-50-25 probability that we saw for heterozygous versus homozygous. In this image, they're using capital A to represent uh, the dominant gene and lowercase a to represent the recessive gene. Now, when that, sec when that progeny self uh, replicates with itself, that third generation self 2 or S2 is going to have different probability of um, genotype for the progeny. So you can see we're starting to drift. We have 25% plus 12%, so we're approaching 40% for homozygous already by S2. And then once we get down here, fast forward to the sixth generation of selfing, we're at a coin toss. We're at almost 50% homozygous for dominant and 50% homozygous for recessive. And where that comes in um, as important is when you think about things like coffee leaf rust resistance. Coffee leaf rust resistance is expressed by the dominant allele. But if you have 50% of your offspring are now coming out with homozygous recessive, they are not going to express coffee leaf rust resistance at all. So if you started at the first generation with a plant that is robustly uh, resistant to coffee leaf rust and you have let it self over time, over generations, you are losing your coffee leaf rust resistance and we're seeing that happen. So what's important about being hermaphroditic and autogamous is that it's difficult to control pollination. We have to work hard to make sure that the coffee um, the flowers of the plant receive the pollen that we want. Controlled pollination means that we get the pollen to the flower that we want. And, and more specifically, we get the pollen to the target mother plant, the, the pollen recipient. And that can be difficult. Most of the ways that that's currently done are expensive and technically difficult and time-consuming. One of those methods is somatic embryogenesis, which is a micropropagation that takes tissue culture and grows an entirely new plant from the tissue culture. It's cloning. But you have to have a lab with specialized equipment. The processes and procedures are technically challenging, and this process is not available widely. Um, one of the alternatives that's cheaper and easier um, but is labor intensive is manual emasculation. So in this image, I'm showing a, co a typical coffee flower. You have typically five petals. And in this picture, these bits here are the stamen or the male parts and the dark colored areas are covered in pollen. So we're producing pollen on these male parts. And then more difficult to see is this white part here. This is the pistil and that's the female part. So in order to control pollination on these plants, one of the things we can do is we can remove the male parts. We can emasculate this flower. So we have to go in and cut the parts. And here's a picture of a breeder doing just that. Now the, the petals and the stamen on coffee flowers are fused together. So in this picture, what we see is where this breeder has already removed or emasculated the stamen and with them the flower petals. So all of these individual nodes here where you see these little stick looking things, these are just the stamen. So these are now only female flowers. And this breeder has to go through and do this manually for each of these flowers on a target branch. 
in order to control pollination. And they have to do this before the male parts become fully mature. So you can see in this image to, in, in the left of the image or to the right of the breeder, you can see that the flowers haven't even fully opened yet. And then this picture shows that they have collected previously pollen and they have it in the jar in the breeder's left hand and then in the right hand is a paintbrush. And they go through and they dip the paintbrush into the pollen and manually apply pollen to each individual female part or pistil all along this branch. And then they have to isolate the branch with this bag. So this bag is an isolation bag to prevent foreign pollen from reaching these female parts. In the top right hand corner you can see a bag of a branch that's been completed and the same in the bottom left hand corner. So as you can imagine this is labor intensive and there's a high chance of, there's a high probability of, of missing something or screwing something up with this because it's such a, an involved process. And this is where male, male sterility comes in. With male sterility, we can build or design a plot or a, a stand of coffee where we intentionally populate that stand with plants that are male sterile for uh, one of a few reasons. It could be genetic or it could be uh, a different mutation that's not genetic that, that causes the plant not to produce pollen or to produce pollen that's inactive. This eliminates the need to manually emasculate the plants. And this is what they discovered um, prior to doing the developing the Starmayas. They discovered a plant in, in Costa Rica in a germplasm um, that was naturally sterile. It, it's a genetic mutation in this case. The plant is labeled CIR. SM01, and I'll just call it the mother plant from here on out. Um, but that, that designation is an accession designation by the germplasm, and germplasms have become an important source of genetic material for coffee breeders, plant breeders, um, because they actually co they collect, they're like l plant libraries. They collect plant and genetic material and store it, they catalog it, store it, and then they make it available to breeders so that they can do experiments with uh, g different genetic material. So it's very handy, um, becoming very popular within the industry. Now we move on to talk about the third concept, which is the seed garden. And male sterility makes the seed garden possible. So now we can take an entire class or group of sterile male coffee plants, plant them in a field of pollen donors that we have chosen. We plan the cross and then we can allow the cross to happen naturally. And then when we harvest the fruit from the sterile, sterile male plant, we are guaranteed to get fruit that was crossed, not selfed. So let's take a look at some pictures from a seed garden. Now this is from the... Um, the third paper, the paper titled Starmaya. And in the top left, what we're looking at here, now on the uh, left half, this is um, their theoretical design for a seed garden. And what you can see is you place fertile plants in a ratio of one fertile plant to four sterile male plants. The reason you do a ratio like this is to ensure an abundance of your target pollen reaches your um, sterile male plants or your mother plants. So your mother plants are the black ones and the fertile plants, the, the pollen donators, are the blue ones. So in this case, the sterile male plant would be the CIR SM01 and the fertile plant was Marcellessa. And Marcellessa is a cultivar that was developed um, by CRAD through a long, the long process of inbreeding and crossing until they found, until they fixed the traits that they wanted in that given plant. Here in the image on the right, we can see the sterile male plants are the uh, taller plants and Marcellessa 
are the shorter plants. So you can see how they laid out the seed garden. And then you can also see this is the flowering. This is a field of only star maya, and you can see the flowering of star maya, pretty robust. You can see pretty high yield. And then in the right, let me get this out of your way. You can see fruiting of star maya. So you can see that it's a pretty high yielding coffee tree. All right, so let's put this all together. Remember, we touched on three key concepts. We touched on what is an F1 hybrid and how we get to it. And importantly, we touched on hybrid vigor, or the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, or the Beatles were greater than Paul McCartney. We talked about male sterility and why that's important for the third term, which is the seed garden. So... The researchers um, of this paper were thinking about the small holders, and the F1 hybrid represents an advantage for the small holders because F1 hybrids are more likely to be climate adaptable, they're more likely to be pest and disease resistant, they're probably going to have greater yield, um, possibly even have greater quality in the final beverage. So there are a lot of benefits to F1 hybrids for smallholders. One of the cons, one of the biggest cons, is they're expensive. Traditionally, the, um, the F1 hybrid produced through somatic embryogenesis can be four times the cost of what an, a seed of an F1 hybrid is available for. So by producing the F1 hybrids and propagating them from seed, we drastically lower the price. And when we drastically lower the price, we get them within reach of the small holder, and that is critical. Um, Starmaya represents um, potential for the small holder in improving their livelihoods. Now, remember I told you we were going to talk some about the economics paper, and this is where we pull that in. So an, a concept that I like that has helped me make sense of this is one that's called the technology frontier. And economics, they, they love to talk about the frontiers. One that they talk about is the efficient frontier. They also have one, um, the production frontier. And when we think about a, front, a technology frontier, think about the amount of technology that a country or an industry or an organization or firm can effectively and efficiently use. So what determines the technology frontier is the, the skill set or the lack of skill set of the entity we're looking at. So if it's a firm, it's the skill set of the laborers, uh, the employees. If you have a majority of employees who are highly skilled, you have a higher technology frontier and you can implement um, more robust, more advanced technology. If you have a largely unskilled labor force, the technology that you can implement is reduced. It's less advanced. And so with Star Maya, it is critical that in order for us to advance the technology frontier, which would be F1 hybrids in this case, that we have to lay those foundations, those knowledge foundations, we have to improve the factor endowment of the individuals in the given region, the given uh, country, whatever you want to, um, whatever we're talking about. And we can see that in um, this article that was recently published in Perfect Daily Grind. Um, we can see that Starmaya is being tested in Vietnam. So this is a really good article. Um, if you want to read more about Star Maya, they don't necessarily talk about Star Maya much by name. Let's see. Yeah, they mentioned the Star Maya's name once, but they're talking about Star Maya throughout the, the article. And they're talking about um, the reason to use F1. So it's a lot of what we've already talked about. But another thing that they touch on in this article is right here, improving farming techniques. So part of the technology, technology transfer from a more developed country or market to a less developed country or market has to be knowledge transfer. You can't just transfer technology and hope for success. You're just gambling at that point. 
if you do a knowledge transfer either before or with the tech, uh, technology transfer, you're going to improve your, your success rate. And I'm very happy to see that the developers of StarMaya are focusing on knowledge transfer as much as they're focusing on just the technology transfer. They could easily just start a seed garden in a target region and start trying to sell F1 hybrids, but they're going to run into a number of hurdles, right? Number one, farmers aren't going to trust a new hybrid right off the bat. Farmers, when they plant a coffee tree, they're stuck with that tree for the long term. Uh, it also has, there is also a lag time between when they plant the tree and it becomes economically productive. And that's typically three to five years. So once a farmer makes the decision to test or utilize or plant a new breed of coffee, they have to wait three to five years before they even see production. And then after that is when they get to see year after year gauge the actual success of that rejuvenation program. So when you do a, a, a technology transfer and bring a new breed of coffee into a region, you need to first and foremost develop trust with the farmers for that breed. And you have to do that through demo and test plots. You have to do that through working with the farmers and showing them new techniques for utilizing this specific breed and how they can best leverage the advantages the advantages that this breed this breed brings so when we when we put it all together when we have f1 seeds and we have stale uh, i keep wanting to say stale sterile male parent stock and we have seed gardens we can then start to pump out seeds for a given region we can start the beginnings of a professionalized seed sector. And this is very important for elevating an entire region um, into a more professionalized, more successful industry or sector and pull up those smallholders and improve their livelihood uh, with seed production, with a, a, a coffee, uh, coffee crop, with a seed crop or a seed garden, we dramatically reduce the cost of propagation and we can start to get more um, more advanced plant stock into the hands of more smallholders at a cheaper price. And before we had seed production, that was very difficult. Traditionally, in Indonesia especially, the way plant stock is distributed is as a seedling. And seedlings are very fragile it's difficult and costly to move them in bulk. Um, imagine the the little potlets that you get with a seed uh, with a seedling sticking out of it. The little um, bags. You can't stack those, so you have one layer. You could stack them if you have an apparatus that that is uh, shelves within your truck or what have you. But you would have to load those in a way that doesn't damage the seedlings, transport them in a way that they don't get jostled around too badly. So the radius, the effective radius of, of um, where you can get those seedlings from where they're, they're grown and propagated is smaller than with a seed garden. Seeds are very stable. You can package them very easily. Sorry about that. I had a visitor I had to take care of. By the way, this morning I'm drinking a lovely uh, fully washed coffee from um, Java Soul Coffee. The beans are from Lisa and Leo's. And um, I visited Lisa and Leo's once. I took, um, I had to finish my uh, Q Processor Pro certification at Lisa and Leo's a couple of years ago. And this coffee is delicious. So, cheers. So we were talking about a professionalized seed sector and the stability of the seeds and how they enable a seed producer to transport them over wide distances. They can store them for long periods of time. They have a solid shelf life. And so 
the ability to propagate F1 hybrid coffee trees through a seed garden could be a game changer. If we look at um, model countries such as Colombia, uh, Colombia has a very professionalized seed sector. This is a picture I took at um, a Seni Cafe research station in Colombia when I attended the World Coffee Producers Forum. And here you can see the seeds are properly marketed, they're properly packaged, professional looking. Um, if we were to zoom in on this picture, we would see that the, the they have germination rates posted on the packaging for the given seed. So they know, for example, that one package or one type of seeds has about an 86% germination rate. Um, all of this empowers a farmer to be able to rejuvenate a plot and know that, okay, I need to buy 14% more coffee seed than I think I need to account for failure to germinate. So if you can imagine a, a coffee sector such as Indonesia, where there is not currently a widespread professionalized seed sector, you can imagine the difference that this could make for smallholders. And this, to me, is the potential, the hope that I have for Star Maya, that it makes a huge difference in professionalizing the coffee sector in Indonesia and bringing that technology frontier forward by a, a strong knowledge transfer and empowering those smallholders to improve their livelihoods. So thank you very much for watching the video to the end. Again, this is the second video in my coffee science series. Let me know what you think about it. Let me know if it was too sciencey. Um, but also, if you enjoyed it, and you want to hear more about Star Maya, let me know because the size of the, um, the research paper lends itself to multiple videos. We, there's more we could talk about regarding Star Maya, the science behind it, and talking about it from a horticulture, coffee industry angle and see dig into some of the more interesting aspects of it. Thank you.